Continuing on in Romans chapter 4, and um, taking a little more time than I wanted to do, uh, spend with these. I'm going a little bit over than what I normally do, but um, we're trying to get a whole chapter covered in an hour, and so that's to be expected, and I think I always do that too. So, um, But we're moving on to Romans chapter 4 um, in our chapter summaries of Romans. Uh, Romans 3 ended the seven volitional testing points uh, that we looked at, uh, number 5, 6, and 7, we dealt with the self-opposer in Romans 3, verses 1 through 8. We dealt with Paul's final conclusion and, and, and of his prosecution, that man is under sin and guilty before God, in verses 9 through 20. And then the last point, that if a person uh, believes that point, that how that Christ died for their sins, was buried and rose again, the redemption that's in him, in verses 21 through 26, then it can be said of them that they are justified freely by his grace, the redemption that's in Christ Jesus and have satisfied God's justice that was once against them uh, by faith in his blood. And so uh, we dealt with that um, in the section of information. And lastly, in Romans chapter 3, Paul began to talk more about the law of faith and the law of faith and the only means that it is that we can uh, therefore benefit from God's righteousness that, uh, that is now ma- manifested without the law and that faith is the only thing compatible with God's justice as well as God's grace. And so that's the means by which we are justified believing in what God has said. And obviously today what God has said is to believe in the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ, that which was progressively revealed throughout time. And now we have the substance of that and we get to believe in the the substance of that message. Paul's going to continue on now uh, proving the issue of justification by faith alone. And Paul does it very uniquely. It's often missed. Uh, When you read Romans 3, verses 27 through 31, and then the rest of chapter 4, is that the way he goes about proving that man is justified by faith today, the Gentiles and the Jews today, uh, is proving it that that's the way that he's been justifying before. Whether the law was in play or whether the law wasn't in play, that God is justified by faith and faith alone. Now, again, the message has changed. Things have been changing throughout time in regards to revealing himself and revealing who man is and those type of things. However, the transaction for one to be justified unto eternal life in God's sight has always been by faith and faith alone. And Paul gives substantial and the preponderance of evidence and very clear evidence to that fact. And he began to do that in Romans 3. And I just want to read the, those verses again uh, briefly and then as we get into chapter 4. Look at Romans 3, verse 27. He says, Where is boasting then? It is excluded. Now again, man has a very, in general, man has a very uh, natural inclination to boast. And when you're talking about being right before God, the, the epitome of that was represented in the Jew, specifically the Pharisee. And Paul, being a Pharisee of the Pharisees, as he describes in Philippians chapter 3, that he was, he would know about this boasting. And we saw in Galatians 2.15, as we've seen in in Matthew chapter 3, the Pharisees, they thought, as as well as John chapter 3, when we dealt with that question, that man thought that even though that they were born of the flesh, that they thought they were naturally righteous. Or they thought that because they were, came from Abraham, they were naturally righteous. Or they thought that, um, that they were able to keep the law and they were naturally righteous. Or they added their traditions and they were able to keep the traditions, even though the traditions didn't keep the law. They put up a system that they thought, well, now I am righteous before God. And uh, their pride was, was great. Even Stephen, when he, before he's stoned, he talks about how they're stiff-necked and they always resisted the Holy Ghost, their fathers and their father's fathers and those type of things. And so what Paul's doing now in talking uh, to those that he would be talking to, both Jew and Gentile, in connection with the gospel of God that has been progressively revealed throughout time, and Paul gets the privilege to manifest this whole thing, uh, he comes along and says, there's no boasting. And it's like he's put an end to this issue. In verse 27, he says, Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? A law of works? Nay. But by the law of faith. That operating principle that you can count on it each and every time. 
I got off the example, you go on top of a building, or don't even have to go on top of a building, you pick up a rock and drop it, it's going to fall to the ground. It's the law of gravity. That's what's going to happen. Uh, unless you have a greater, a, a law that can, is greater than that law of gravity, like the law of aerodynamics, now I don't even know that's a law, but then you can fly, you can defy, you can defy gra gravity, as it were, for, for a time and those type of things. And that's essentially what we have, but you have the law of faith. And that law of faith is not just established with us in, in Paul's gospel. The issue of faith has always been an issue, of faith alone in order to be justified in God's sight. And he's going to talk about that more. Look at verse 28. Therefore we conclude, and when you make a conclusion, by the way, when you do a scientific experiment, and by the end you get to that scientific experiment, you make a conclusion, your conclusion is based upon the evidence, Right? That means that your conclusion is something that you can make based upon it working time and time again. And so a conclusion doesn't mean that this hasn't been taking place prior to Paul's conclusion. It just means it has been taking place and Paul gets the privilege to conclude the whole matter. Here's what God's been doing throughout time, testifying to and witnessing to. We've seen that term in verse 21 of chapter 3, that he's been progressively revealing throughout time. And now it's fully revealed, it's fully manifested Paul can make declarations in connection with it, and he's going to come along and give his conclusion on the matter. He says, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So if that's true, that a conclusion is not something that is just taking place with Paul, which he gets to conclude it, but it's a conclusion based upon the evidence... That means this has always been taking place, and Paul's just concluding it. That even those that were under the law and would be doing the deeds of the law were not justified by faith with the deeds of the law, or justified by faith plus works. They were justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Now, let me throw you a little, a little bone, and we'll go pick it up here in a second. That doesn't mean that there's not a justification by faith plus works, or for Israel, faith plus the deeds of the law, but just not a justification unto eternal life. And that's what Paul's dealing with here in this context and other contexts, and we'll look at that here in a second. Verse 29, and how Paul's going to prove this, he's, as he, or as he concludes it, he says in verse 29, is he the God of the Jews only? And what he's talking about is how he as God justifies by faith without the deeds of the law. He describes how he's been doing that with the Jews. And just hold on because he's going to go back before the Jews here in a second. But the way in which God as he is has been justifying the Jews who have been under the law by the way is he's been justifying them by faith without the deeds of the law. And he says, if God, is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. And thank God, because that's exactly how we need to be justified as well. That's how we need to be able to get eternal life as well, is by faith and faith alone. Verse 30, seeing it is one God, and that's an important phrase, this is something that oftentimes isn't seen. Whether you're talking about in Christianity as a whole or in the, in the grace movement, is you have to see this. Seeing it is one God. And what he's getting to is, since he's one God, he justifies the same way all the time. Now again, that doesn't mean there's not differences from time past now and ages to come in regards to the message in which an individual believes. But the response that God's looking for f for all time is faith. And upon that person's faith, God responds by justifying that individual. So the message changed a lot. The, God's word changes and gets progressively revealed. But the, the transaction of how one is justified into an eternal life doesn't. And again, seeing it as one God, you either have to have, you either have to make God have two ways of justifying or you need two gods. And that's not what he's saying here. He's saying he justified the Jews this way. And he's justifying you this way. as one God. By the way, that's something to throw in. When Paul over there in Ephesians chapter 4. 
talks about the unity of the Spirit, and he talks about there is one God. I'll just throw that out. But he says, as he is the God of the Jews only, is he not also the Gentiles? Yes, the Gentiles also seen as one God, which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. And yes, there is a difference between by and through, because the law is in the play, but it's not by faith plus works or through faith plus, it's, it's by faith and through faith. Faith alone in both of them, but the by and through are different and uh, we should have some time uh, this morning to, to talk about the difference. And then verse 31, he comes along and says, Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. And what we're going to learn is that the law was a schoolmaster for those under it to bring them unto faith. It was designed to lead them and school them that they couldn't do it themselves. They had to rely exclusively on God to provide them the righteousness of the law. And the way in which he was going to do that eventually is, is, is the cross. But they had to believe that. And we'll take a look at that here in a second. Now Paul's going to continue on this evidence that justification unto eternal life has been by faith alone since the beginning of time, or since when, it, when there was a need for it with Adam onward until there's no longer a need for it because, he, uh, because every man will be justified or he rids the world of wickedness. But look at chapter 4, verse 1. What shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory but not before God. Now, Paul knows something. Oftentimes, it's not recognized that Paul knows it, but Paul knows that Abraham was justified twice. Abra uh, Paul knew that Abraham was justified twice and that he knows of both justifications. Only one is unto eternal life, and they happened in a progressive order. The first one that needs to take place is justification unto eternal life, and then there was another justification for those that would be of Abraham's seed. But in Paul saying what he's saying, he's, he's, he's highlighting justification by faith alone. Look at verse 2 again. For if Abraham were justified by works, he was. He hath whereof to glory. And he can with this other justification. However, he, he, he keeps going on. He says, but not before God. If Abraham were justified by works, which he was, he has aware of the glory, he can, he's supposed to, but not before God. And this one, his other justification is not supposed to be mixed up with, his, with the first justification. Now that might not make any sense to you right now, um, but we'll get to it. And what, again, what Paul's substantiating is justification before God, in the sight of God, unto eternal life, has always been by faith and faith alone. And he's going to utilize how he did it with Abraham and how he did it with David. And he's also going to utilize Abraham's other justification to further validate justification unto eternal life is by faith alone. So it's a whole bunch of things he's bringing in to substantiate it's always been by faith and faith alone. Verse 3. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Hold your hand here. Come with me to Genesis 15. Genesis 15, look at verse 5. Abraham's questioning whether he's going to have a seed. He's wondering if the steward of his house, Eleazar of Damascus, is going to be his, his heir. God takes him out and says, verse 5. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, count them up. If thou be able to number them, he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he, that's Abram, Believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. When he talks about believe in him, it's not just the fact that he is God. That's part of it. Believed in him in regards to making his seed as greater than the number of the stars. So it's not only believing in him that he is, but in his power and capacity. And to do what he's promised to do. But he believed in the Lord, and he, that's God, counted it to him, that's Abram, for righteousness justified unto eternal life. Come back to Romans chapter 3. So he just gets done talking about Abraham, and now he's going to give this little conclusion here. 
and how this is applicable to us here in verses 4 and 5. Now, to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for what? So you believe, on, you believe in him, God, in his capacity, and whatever message is declaring his power and his capacity, for us it's the cross, and you believe that today, and you can be justified. He counts it for righteousness. But if you think you've got to work for it, it's counted as a reward, and now uh, you're in debt to him. He's going to build this up even more. He, he deals with Abraham, gives a little application. Now he's going to go to David. And then he's going to go back to Abraham and talk about some objections that he knows that he's going to hear. Or possibly one could bring up. Verse 6. What's that first word? Even. Even in light of what well, he just got done talking about Abraham and bringing the application to us now. Even. So with Abraham and us, now he's going to bring up David. And the significance about this is Abraham wasn't given the law. So there you have an example of how God justified by faith alone who doesn't have the law. But David is a man who is justified by faith and he had the law. He was under the law. And what Paul does is he, 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 he makes it equal unto all. Abraham before the law, David with the law, and now us. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without what? Works. Works. Who's describing this? And by the way, that word describe is telling you he already possessed it. And not only that he possessed it and already possessed it, but he knew he possessed it. When you describe something... That's, what, that's, that's how he can describe it. He can describe it because he's already experienced. He already has it. He's describing it to someone. Verse 7, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Now again, I know there's, a, there's, there's issues to talk about in regards to covered and all those type of things. But that's not supposed to be looked at in connection with you can be justified by faith plus works. That's supposed to be looked at in connection with when the payment was going to be made. And, and those type of things. We're not going to deal with that right now for time's sake. Verse 8. He, by the way, that's Psalm 32 there. We're not going to go back there. Verse 8. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Now verse 9. Cometh this blessedness. By the way, the blessedness David just described, he's going to come along now and say, Cometh this blessedness upon the circumcision only. So what he's going to do is he's going to talk about the blessedness David described, and he's going to utilize Abraham to talk about who it comes upon. Which again, there's what, hundreds of years between Abraham and David. It says, Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only? Does it sound familiar to verse 29 of chapter 3? Is he the God of the Jews only? In regards to how he's going to justify someone. Or upon the uncircumcision also. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. Here's the objections. Okay, faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness, but Abraham was circumcised. Verse 10. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. Abraham was justified without the law. He was justified without circumcision. He was justified as an uncircumcised man. Folks, God justifying by faith alone the uncircumcised today is not the mystery of Christ. Because if that's true, if that's the mystery of Christ, then you can't come along and call Abraham our father. But he is our father. In regards to justification by faith alone. In regards to the gospel of God that God has progressively been, been revealing. With, with Adam, he talks about the seed of the woman. Uh, with, with Abram, he'll, he'll talk about justification and, and, and by faith. And, and focus on the, the, the faith issue with, with, with Abraham. With David, he'll talk about the, the, the justification issue. But also talk about the relationship as being a son 
uh, and those type of things. And with, with Christ, he spells it all out even more. And, and you start to see that with the disciples, and, and, and we get that. We get that, those spiritual provisions. So it wasn't reckoned to Abraham when he was in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. Verse 11. And he received the what? The sign of circumcision. What does a sign do? It points to something, right? It, 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 it either will point to something that's ahead or point to, you, to something backwards, whatever it might be. But it's a sign. It's an outward indicator. Even though it be covered up in regards to physical circumcision, it's an outward indicator. But it's an outward indicator of something that had already taken place. Now with Abraham, it's a little different because he was a grown man when God gave him the covenant of circumcision. But he, he, had, he was justified already and that physical circumcision was supposed to be a sign of the righteousness that he already had with God. And what every Jew after that, every circumcised boy on the eighth day was supposed to realize is that I'm not naturally righteous. They should have went all the way back to their father Abraham and seen that he was, circumcised, that, that he was uncircumcised and he was justified in his uncircumcision. And that, 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 that outward indicator, there's, there's two issues there, but that outward indicator, you better make sure that you have a righteousness and an inward circumcision just like Abraham had. See, the outward circumcision was, was an indicator for Abraham of his inward circumcision of being justified in God's sight. And for everyone that came after that, it was going to be backwards, but they were supposed to learn from their father as be passed down that I was circumcised the eighth day, but there's, there's a reason why he got that. To show that he's righteous inwardly because he believed God. And it was supposed to be a day after day reminder that you ought to be believing in God for your righteousness. Instead, they completely flipped it up and they said, because I am circumcised, I'm righteous. Instead of, I need to believe God to be righteous. It was a sign. By the way, this is one of those things that became hid in Israel's program. When you're over there in 2 Corinthians 4, he talks about the Old and New Testament. Um, you don't have to turn there, but if you want, I'll give you the reference. 2 Corinthians 4. He talks about this ministry that we've received after he gets done talking about the Old and New Testaments. Verse 2 of chapter 4, he says, But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. The issue of how to view circumcision became hid in Israel's program. The same thing with the Old Covenant and what that was supposed to do. It became hid, and Paul renounces those hidden things of dishonesty. And what they did is Israel didn't properly handle circumcision. They didn't properly handle the law covenant. And so Paul comes along, and he renounces it, and he begins to properly handle those things. And you get to see what was supposed to be taught of it, and that wasn't. You get to see what's supposed to, how that's supposed to be taught rightly. The Lord began to do that in regards to circumcision and the covenant. Circumcision, not necessarily the same exact way, because he was a, a, a Jew. Um, again, there was another purpose for circumcision, but in regards to justification, he talked about it the right way. And with Paul, too, you get the whole, the whole package. Um, look, uh, if, if you turn over there, 2 Corinthians 4, you can come back to chapter 4 of Romans and verse 11. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had, yet being uncircumcised, that he, that's Abraham, might be a father of all them that believe. Now, you remember, before Genesis 15, you had Genesis 12. Let's look back there. Look at Genesis 12. Genesis chapter 12, look at verse 1. He calls Abram out of the Ur of Chaldeas to leave that territory, which was in the rough location of Nimrod's kingdom, which was a great kingdom. It wasn't a, Nim, a, 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 a typical Nimrod kingdom like we think of Nimrod today. Nimrod was a, was a very smart, intelligent individual. 
And the Lord said unto Abram, verse 1, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Remember that blessedness that David described, and now Paul is going back to Abraham to describe that blessedness? That's what that blessing is. The foundation of the blessing is eternal life. There's more to the blessing when you read verse 3, and I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in, uh, so the blessing goes more than just eternal life. It goes into some other things that an individual might not get based upon whether they're bless Abraham or, or curse him. But look at the end of verse 3. It says, and in thee, that's in Abraham, and, 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 and really in Abraham, his seed, that's, good, that's in him, in thee, shall all families of the what? Earth be blessed. The seed that Abram's carrying that's going to then bring forth the Christ who's going to die on the cross is going to provide the blessing. And the blessing that we're concerned with right now is not a kingdom, not prosperity, not victory over their enemies, blessing. What we're simply talking about now is justification unto eternal life. That's what Abraham's seed is going to bring. And so when he says there in Romans 4 again, in verse 11, halfway down, it says that he might be the father of all them that believe. In, all, in, in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now according to their program, that's out here. But the provision of the blessing is right here and we get that. And therefore, because of that, through Abraham, he can be our father and how he was justified unto eternal life. And he's going, to, he's going to describe all them that believe. Look at the rest of the verse. Though they be not circumcised. So he's the father of the uncircumcised. And he says that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. And the father of circumcision. This is that uh, inward circumcision. To them who are not of the circumcision only. But, also, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had been yet uncircumcised. And again, the father's circumcision there is the inward circumcision. Jump back to chapter 2. Not only did a Jew need the outward circumcision to be identified as the nation of Israel and, be, and participate in their unique role in God's redemptive plan for the earth, but that had no significance in the end all if you didn't have the right circumcision eventually and that was the inward circumcision the what the outward one was supposed to be a sign of and as the of the inward man and Paul talked about this a little bit before in chapter 2 he says verse 28 he is not a Jew which is one outwardly neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh but he is a Jew, which is one, what? Inwardly. Inwardly. And circumcision is that of the what? And in the what? Spirit. And not in the letter whose praise is not of men, but of God. Folks, we need that circumcision just as much as Abraham did. That inward circumcision. Now, does that make us a Jew? And we're a spiritual Jew today and those type of things? No, because the, the, this, this been changed, the, the dispensation has changed. But we need that inward circumcision. In fact, look at Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Look at verse 3 just for time's sake. Because i got to get moving here. Philippians 3 verse 3. It says, for we are the what? We are the circumcision. Which worship God in the spirit. And rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the what? See, the Jews took that outward circumcision and put their confidence in it when it was supposed to point them to something that Abraham had when he was uncircumcised. And therefore have no confidence in their flesh. It was, it was, it was supposed to be a cutting off of the flesh to take that away and get that confidence out of there and rely upon God. 
One more. Look at Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, look at verse 10. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are what? Circumcised with the what? Circumcision made with hands. No, without hands. See, that's the circumcision you need. In putting off of the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So now Paul packages that with, with this. And in, in his gospel and in his, in his epistles. And the purpose of all of it, that's all been talked about before. The purpose of all of it is in connection with his hidden purpose in regards to the mystery of Christ with us today, specifically. Um, come back to, to Romans 4. That's why I fought, uh, Abraham's our father. He's the father of circumcision, that inward circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, the, the physical circumcision. The physical circumcision need the inward circumcision as well. But not to them only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham. And that would, that would take care of both. The physical circumcision, if you walk in the steps of the, your father Abraham, then you'll get that inward circumcision. And those that don't have the physical circumcision, if you walk in those steps, you'll have the inward circumcision. That's a tongue twister for you. Which he had being yet uncircumcised. Verse 13. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world, whom God is utilizing in the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of what? I was going to bring up the law in connection with all this. For if, he, for if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is what? Made. made void. And the promise made of none effect. I want you to go over to the commentary on this in Galatians. Galatians chapter 3. God places a lot of emphasis on chronology, the order of events. We talk about a lot sense and sequence. It's because God does that. He's talking about Abraham uh, for uh, essentially through all this. Uh, let's just pick it up. Let's pick it up here in verse um, five. He therefore that ministered to you, they, again, they, want, they started hearing the law and doing the works of the law. He says, He therefore that ministered to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he, he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And therefore get that blessing of eternal life. The scripture foreseeing that God would justify... No, it, if it for, well, we'll leave that. The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith. Again, that's not the mystery. The scripture, the scripture foresaw that. The mystery, there's nothing in regards to the mystery of Christ that the scripture can foresee. And so, again, there's a difference between the gospel of God, that which was progressively revealed, that Paul hearkens back to all over the place, to the mystery of Christ, in regards to something that wasn't testified to before, wasn't declared before, wasn't witnessed, wasn't foresawn, it's completely hidden God. And we got to, again, make that distinction. Anyways, he said, The scripture foreseen that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham. It's part of the gospel of God there. Saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then, they which be of faith, Paul's taking that one thing out of all the other promises that he gave them in connection with it being fulfilled out here. He's taking one, one thing out back here and he's saying, you get that blessing too. It's absolutely phenomenal when you read those scriptures and you read everything that God does with Abraham and here Paul's just taking one thing out and, 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 and how he's utilizing it today. We'll talk about that when we go through our study of the Bible series on Thursdays, but... Uh, verse 9, so then they which uh, be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Verse 10, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Now a man under the law, even though they weren't justified by the works or the deeds of the law, they still had to do the law. The law was more than just 
a way in which you could try to go about gaining your justification to eternal life. It was your national well-being. Uh, there was blessings and curses attached to it based upon whether you were doing them or not. Uh, there were sacrifices that you had to do. So you, the one under the law still had to do those things. But that doesn't mean, but, but they were supposed to recognize in connection with being right before God. It was, it was, it was actually designed to teach them, by this, I can't, I, I, I'm not right before you. And we'll see that here in a little bit. Verse 11, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is what? Evident, for the just shall live by faith, and he quotes Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 4. He doesn't even quote Paul there. You think you would quote Paul? You know, Paul quotes that? Habakkuk. As the, one, of the, the found, one of the foundational pieces of his gospel in Romans chapter 1, verse 16 through 18 there. It says, for the just shall live by faith. The way God's justifying now, this is the way God's justifying then. The way, but yet he's giving that now outside of his program to Israel. You don't have to wait till here, here to get that. You can get it right now. This is a dispensation of that grace. Verse 12, the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for his written curses every one that hangeth on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise. As you go through Galatians, you have to be able to distinguish the promise and the promises, by the way. We receive the promise of the Spirit, that's the eternal life, through faith. Now he's going to substantiate this. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, and God confirmed his covenant with Abraham, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. So once this covenant's in play, nothing can alter it. Verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith, and to see, uh, he saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is who? Christ. And this I say, so I don't know if I mentioned, if it was in the first session or this session, but I talked about seeing it as one God. Well, here he talks about how it is one seed, one Christ, one Lord. That helps you understand Ephesians 4. When he talks about the unity of spirit, because when he talks about the unity of spirit, he's not just talking about what's going on now. He starts Ephesians chapter 1 talking about how he's going to gather it all together. And the unity of spirit are the pinnacles and the, and the pillars of how he's going to gather that thing together. And when you're talking about one body there in Ephesians 4, he's not just talking about the body of Christ. He's talking about a body out here made up of Israel on the earth and us in the heavenly places. Well, We'll deal with that in due time. Verse 17. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, so God confirmed that Abrahamic covenant, that in thee, Abraham, with, that's Christ. Now look at which, which that covenant no man can disannul or add it thereto. And he's not, he's not going to add to it or disannul. Or he's going to add to it, but it's not going to add something in order to have justification. He said... Uh, he says, uh, uh, there it is, the law, which was 430 years after. He brings up this, the amount of time that transpa uh, uh, transpired from when he made the covenant of Abraham to the law comes in. 430 years after, cannot disannul. And by, <laughs> by the way, that covenant, that law covenant, that's the man's covenant. That's what they wanted. And it cannot disannul what God, that covenant of promise, what he covenanted with Abraham. Cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. The reason why I'm going here is because Romans 4 set forth the issue of uh, if the law, uh, for if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of none effect. And chapter 3 says, do we make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we established a law. So you get to see how these things work. Look at verse 18 of Galatians 3. For if the inheritance be of the law, the inheritance of eternal life, it is no more of promise. It, God started it by promise. You believe in him, I give you eternal life. If the law comes in now and changes that, 
you change the way in which God established his justice and how he would justify. And therefore, it would be no more by promise. But, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Okay, then what do we do with the law? Verse 19. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of what? Transgressions. Transgressions. Because man was transgressing, and now the law was added, not to add works to faith, to be justified by. It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. He talks about how the covenants were given there. Now pick it back up here in verse 21. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life... Verily, you, yes, righteousness should have been by the law. If there could have been a law given in which man could be justified by, surely it would have came by the law. Faith plus works, but it can't. And the law never came in to add works to something that he established 430 years earlier to add to it as if that was insufficient. The law was added transgressions. But you also have to see that when it was added, it didn't make void faith. Or however you want to look at it, the other way around. Because the law still can work the faith issue. Look at what he does. Verse 22. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. I'm going to explain this to you here in a second. But before faith came... We were kept under the law, shut up from the faith, which should... Yeah, shut up unto. Big difference. Shut up from is that you don't have... You can't go this way. You can't go the way of faith. The law comes into play. It doesn't shut, up, didn't shut them up from faith. It shut them up unto. It was supposed to school them. Don't go that way of works. Go the faith route. It shut them up unto it. It was added to transgressions. Look at your transgressions. There's no way you can be justified by faith plus works or works in and of themselves. You can't do that. Go unto faith. It was, it was to lead them to faith and faith alone. The writer of Hebrews talks about this too. Look at verse, uh, verse 23. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster. It taught them something. And guess what? It taught them something hard. It was a master over them. And what it was supposed to do every, t every day they woke up and they had to do that and they had to offer the sacrifices daily, weekly, monthly, yearly. And they had to do all the festivities and, the, and the, their calendar and all this stuff. They were supposed to look at that and say, God, you want me to do this to be right in your sight. I can't do this. Do you know individuals knew, learned that in Israel's history? We just read one, David. And all those other prophets and, those, and, and, and a lot of other individuals learned that. Daniel's a perfect example. He's, he's, he's right here. <coughs> Daniel's right here. He, he lives through the Babylonian captivity and into the, the second captivity under the Medo-Persian Empire, even though they allow him to go back into the land. And Daniel's wondering, why in the world is this stuff happening? And guess what he reads? He reads Leviticus and he reads Jeremiah, the law and the prophets. He says, this is why it's happening. Because we can't keep the law. This is why we're in Babylonian captivity. This is why our people are suffering. Not because God just wants to be harsh on us. It's because we can't measure up. And it was supposed to teach them that and, and get worse and worse and worse. The worst of it's going to be out here. And guess what? Man, a lot of men are still going to deny that, they're, that, that, that they have to come through God to be righteous in His sight. When it's going to get the worst. But it was supposed to school them, to bring them unto Christ. And Christ is not just His, his person. The way Paul uses Christ, too, is the issue of, of God's power. And so Paul will talk about Christ back here when, when Christ isn't necessarily known about in connection with the cross. But it's God doing for Israel something they can't do for themselves. That's Christ. 
Christ is going to be the means by which God does that for them. And, and, and what that law is supposed to do is to bring them unto Christ, that God, you have to do it. And that's what Daniel says. Daniel 9, go read it. He knows, by, he, he knows a whole bunch of things that are going on in the law because my iniquity and the iniquity of my fathers, he says, righteousness belongs to you, O God. Got it, Daniel. You got it. That's what I'm trying to teach every individual in the nation, that righteousness belongs to me. Not you. You're righteous, Daniel. Because your faith, and his faith, by the way, in the law, but not for works, but in the schoolmaster of that law. And that's what they were supposed to get to. And that's what many did. And that's what Paul's talking about here. That even when the law came into play, it didn't disannul faith. It shut them up unto faith. So that when the faith of Christ, when that promise was come, that those that had faith back here, I give that to you now. And we, talk, we looked at Romans 3, that for forbearance, he forbeared their faith in the incomplete payment that they didn't have yet, but if they had faith, God justified them in his forbearance, crediting them justification and righteousness because he knew the, the promise was going to come. Because he's God. And so the law... Never justified by faith plus works or works itself. That doesn't mean they, didn't, they have to participate in it. But when you talk about justification unto eternal life in God's sight, it never did. It, it was supposed to school them that the only way you can be justified is by faith alone. Look at the righteousness that's in the law. You're trying to do it. I can't do it. Boom. This only belongs to you, God. You have to give this to me. Yep, you're right. And I'm going to... The promised seed is going to come. And when Christ came on the scene, guess what? The issue of just believing God, righteousness belongs to you, that's insufficient now. Because now his seed has come. They've got to believe that Jesus is their righteousness. And once he dies on the cross, the thing that starts becoming the issue is that was the means by which he was going to provide for their righteousness. Now for us, we have the complete package, and you've got to believe that cross work. It's not just believing that Jesus is our righteousness. It's believing that he died on the cross for our sins, was buried, and rose again. But that's how things were progressively revealed, and that's where they are now. And that's, there's a dispensation in connection with that, of, of manifesting that, as well as a new purpose that that has. But Israel's to know these things as well as they go out there. We'll talk about that another time. We'll come back with me to Romans Romans chapter 4, and I've got to wind down here in just a few minutes. So we're going to run through these things. Look at verse 15 of Romans 4. Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. God always justifies through the provision of his grace. And the only thing compatible with his grace is faith. The, uh, to the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed. That's the only thing that gives assurance regards to justification of eternal life is faith and faith alone. Not to that only which is of the law, those that would be under the law, because those under the law we know now can be, we, and they, a lot of them did know and were schooled by it, that they could be justified even though they were under the law, and they could be justified by faith and faith alone. But to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Now, in verses 17 down to verse 22, essentially, Paul begins to examine Abraham's faith and the components of, oftentimes you hear, I don't really like use, uh, talking about it this way, but saving faith, um, what, what faith actually saves you and those type of things. Well, that's what Paul examines here in regards to Abraham. And there's two things that faith has resident within it and is the reason why it's compatible with God's grace. Because it trusts in God and, and what that means. And that's summed up essentially in verse 17. As is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God. And now he's going to talk about God. Who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. And these are those two things. Quickening the dead is the issue of his eternal power. And he has the capacity to do what he says. Now, obviously, we know the resurrection is a part of that. 
But he's talking about it from the stance of, of Abraham, even though there's resurrection involved in that as well. But quicken at the dead. He, eternal power, capacity to do what he says. This is also that, he, that God is able to do the seemingly impossible. Do you know that's what we believe when we believe the gospel? That when you have the list of your sins that you've committed and that you will commit, and you come along and hear that Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again, and if you believe that gospel, he'll forgive you all your sins. That's impossible. Not with God. Calleth those things which be not as though they were. His Godhead has certainty of counsel. There's the absolute truth. He speaks things in past tense. We always talk about that if you believe in the gospel, how they died for your sins and buried and rose again, that moment you possess eternal life. Well, how do you know? Have you ever been on the other side and come back? No, but I know one that has. And he's the one you need to believe. And there's a certainty of his counsel. That's what makes a faith that you believe that God's able to do the seemingly impossible for today, that he forgives you all your sins, past, present, and future, and he gives you eternal life. And you believe that now because you know who he is and what he's able to do and what he's provided and those type of things. And then he brings it back to us in verse 23 through 25. He says, Now it, it, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for who? Us. For us also. To whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. And if you believe that, chapter 5, verse 1, Here's the, the result. Therefore being what? Justified. Justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ and so on. I want to end in James chapter 2 and just kind of have this be like an appendage or append maybe not appendage, appendix? Appendage, isn't that something in your appendix? appendix. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> you get, hopefully you get the point. Come with me to James chapter 2. James chapter 2. Now, I mentioned earlier that Israel had another justification. By the way, we do too. We'll deal with that as we get further on in Romans chapter 8. It's not a justification unto eternal life. When you understand how terms can be used, they can be used in so many different contexts. We saw in the first session in Romans 3, I believe it's in 1, 2, 3, verse 4, Yea, uh, God forbid, yea, let God be true and every man a liar, that when thou judgest, thou shalt be, uh, I'm going to butcher it, Hold. that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, I think he says, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. God is going to be justified. If we liken justification always from the debt and penalty of our sins, then we have to come along and say, God has sins because he's going to be justified. No, justifica justification and justified can be used in so many different contexts. In fact, the scriptures have about eight different kinds of justifications. We went through those when we went through Romans 3. Um, I don't have a list of them right now, but because they have different contexts. The main one, obviously, is justification unto eternal life, because that's the most significant of all justifications. Uh, anytime, essentially, you have a judgment you have a justification involved. And you've got to deal with a judgment now so you can get justification unto eternal life. You have a justification or a, a non-justification, as it were. Um, and the, what was talked about in Romans 3 there, that God's going to be justified here. When every man gives their attempt and their escape tactics and excuses and all those type of things, God's going to be justified that he's true and every man's a liar. And that's, what, that's what's going to take place there. Um, in regards to Israel's works, as they, the little flock, as they go through here, that second coming, there's good, they're going to receive a justification here. And that's what James is picking up, by the way. I want you to see this. Um, look at James chapter 2. By the way, when you start in James chapter 1, um, let 
Look at verse, look at verse 18. He says, of his own, of his own will, begat he us with the word of truth. Now, if you've been paying attention to Israel's program from the gospel accounts, one of those passages is, is, is John chapter 3 of being begotten or being begotten, being born again. That means you're justified. And that's what he was dealing with Nicodemus in. And it was by the, by the word of truth. It was by the, the word of God. And these ones that James is addressing are already justified unto eternal life. The privilege that they have now he says, of, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. Why? That we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. That we can do some things right now before the kingdom gets established. That's essentially what that's saying. And now he's going to bring up Abraham and Rahab in connection with this. Of their faith not being dead, but being functionally alive and producing something. But the, the, uh, the, the, the issue is they're already justified unto eternal life. Now look at verse um, 14 of chapter 2. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? Well, it depends on what salvation you're talking about. If you're talking about salvation from the debt and penalty of your sins, yes, it can. But if you're talking about a different salvation in Israel's program, Faith won't save you from that. And so, just like justification, there's many different salvations. And there's a grace that is to come to them of the privilege of being able to walk into that kingdom. And, 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 and being saved from some things of, of, of not being able to get into that kingdom right away, even though they have eternal life. And that's all having to understand Israel's program to, to grasp that. But that's what he's talking about here. And oftentimes, that's what isn't understand when you come to James. James isn't Genesis. James isn't Daniel. James isn't Matthew. James is James, and it has all, these other, all this information, all this information before it. And if you want to get a good grasp on it, gosh, go study. And that's what he's bringing up here. We'll, we'll, we'll compare another passage here in a second. Can faith save him? Verse 15, if a brother or sister be naked, and, and by the way, also their physical life is at stake here. And they could physically die, even though they'll be resurrected in the kingdom. But if they don't participate in some things, they could, their, their life could be at risk. Uh, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of, of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, we, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, being dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works. Let me ask you a question. When you believe the cross, can you show your faith? That's one of the most hardest things when you're counseling someone or dealing with someone to whether you deal with them as a believer or unbeliever. You can't see their faith. And if you were to go off of their works and those type of things, that's a, that's a different issue. But the issue of showing faith is a secondary issue to bringing faith into existence. And by the way, just because it's dead doesn't mean it's not in existence. Just because it's dead doesn't mean it's not we're, we're, we're dealing with a, a, a context kind of like this in Romans 8. That if ye walk after the flesh, ye shall what? If you walk after the flesh, you, don't have, you know you don't have faith, right? Because when you walk after the Spirit, you're minding the things of the Spirit, the Word of God, and faith receives the Word of God. And when you walk after the flesh, well, you're not relying upon God's Word. You're not relying upon His things. Your faith is dead. Does that mean that you're not a believer? No. So that's, that's what he's dealing with here. and I'll, 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 You'll see it even more. Um, verse 18. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. 
Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. So he's not trying to bring faith into existence for the first time. He's trying to have them show their faith because this becomes an important issue for them out there. Verse 21, he's going to bring up Abraham and, and Rahab. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? Well, wait, Paul. We just read Paul and he was justified by faith alone without works. Yeah, he was. Both of them. This one is Genesis 17. Remember I talked about chronology? This one's Genesis 17. The first one, Genesis 15. Two justifications. No reason to reconcile them like most of church history has tried to do. Just keep them where they're at. And there's two of them. And guess what? Israel had to learn about both. And that's why he's bringing it up here. Verse 20, uh... Uh, verse 21, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. Perfect is a sanctification issue. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, colon, what's the next word? And. and. This is an additional issue. And he was called the friend of God. Abraham was not called the friend of God the moment that he was justified unto eternal life. That took place later on in his life. And the issue now is, is that these Jews who are scattered abroad among the Gentiles, they have to, show, they have to be justified in the eyes of men to show forth the glory of God to make an impact upon them. And you might ask, where do I get that from? We're going to have to leave the rest of this. Come with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. The Gentiles who are going to be scattered in those Gentile nations, specifically after the midpoint of the tribulation period here, have to show their faith if they want to receive reward and be perfect in their faith and those type of things. And James talks about that. Hebrews talked about that. And now Peter's going to talk about it. Verse 11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pil pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, Having your conversation honest among the who? We're going to be among the Gentiles. The Lord taught them about that as well. That whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your what? Good works. Good works, which they shall what? When you behold something, do you see it? Yes. You see it. And if you're on the other end, are you showing something? Yes. Yeah, you're showing something. They see it. They're beholding it. Glorify God in the day of visitation. They get, their whole purpose is to be the light of the world and, and, and the salt of the earth out here. James telling them they can be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. They, get to, they, can, they can do that now before that kingdom is even established. They're, I'm going to provide you an opportunity. You're going to be scattered among the Gentiles. By your good works, show. Show your faith. And that's going to make an impact Gentiles to the point where they may be able to be saved themselves and enter into that kingdom. Like the Lord said, many will come from the east and the west and sit down at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Gentiles sitting down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Like that Roman centurion and that Canaanite woman there in Matthew 15. And that's, what, that's what's going to take place. The Gentiles become the focus when you get to the end here because the nation's going to be set up and God's going to have done what he wants done with that nation. And now the issue is the blessing go forth to those Gentiles. Well, there's... There's many kinds of justification in the Bible. There's two of them. Romans 4 is setting forth the issue of justification unto eternal life by faith and faith alone. And it's been that way from beginning until the end. But there is another kind of justification um, in regards to Israel's program. I brought it up in connection with ours as well. You read 1 Corinthians chapter 4. He brings up himself being justified in connection with not uh, uh, living by man's words and those type of things, but being justified at the judgment seat of Christ. And, 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 and we're all going to be justified in that sense uh, to some degree or manner. Can't deal with that right now. But, but the main issue there in Romans 4 is that justification unto eternal life. And how he proves that today is by going back and dealing with Abraham, going back and dealing with David, one man not under the law, one man under the law, to prove that that blessedness comes by faith and faith alone, that eternal life. And when the law came into play, it didn't disannul what God already established with Abraham. And he found it, by the way, which means it had been there before him. 
Abraham just found it. God had him find it, as it were. He became the father of it. And it became a main, the, the, the main issue of how you get justified unto eternal life. The law didn't disannul it. Rather, it shut them up unto it. That if they believed in the message, that schoolmaster of the law, that righteousness belongs to you, God would justify them based upon his forbearance. And when the complete payment was made, he could take that payment and apply it to those that had faith back here. And as things moved on, when the Christ came, it was no longer righteousness belongs to you because you're here with us now. Believe Jesus Nazareth is the Christ. He is your righteousness. And then once the cross came into play, that's the mechanical means, that's the, that's the provision there that they would have to come to believe after that. And we're after that, the dispensation of God's grace and packaging all that together. That's the content of what we believe today. And that's how we get justified unto eternal life. Does it have an element of all these things back here? Yes, in one sense. But now it's revealed. Now it's manifest. It's clearly seen. And that's what we believe to be justified unto eternal life. And therefore we can learn from Abraham, David, that it, faith is the main issue, not to be mixed up with other kinds of justification that involve works that our sanctification issues are secondary, important, but are secondary issues to that of justification unto eternal. Just like Abraham, Genesis 15, then Genesis 17. So too is ours. Justification unto eternal life, Romans 1 through 5, and then sanctification 6, 7, 8, and, and onward. Well, let's pray to conclude, and we'll pick it up next week in Romans chapter 5 and 6. Father, we thank you for this time to get into your word, to look at these things in the detail in which we were able to summarize Romans chapter 4, to look at the, the, the preponderance of evidence that justification is by faith and faith alone by looking at two individuals, one not under law, one under the law, Abraham and David, and seeing when righteousness was imputed to uh, Abram, not when he was in circumcision, but uncircumcision, and look at even David who was under the law, that the law didn't disannul what God established with Abraham when it came to how God justifies unto eternal life. And so, Father, we thank you for that. We thank you that, that, that you're not the God of the Jews only, but you are also of the Gentiles in which we are today in this dispensation of grace. And therefore, we need to believe as well um, in the message that we're giving and, given, and that is the, the, the complete manifestation of your righteousness, not only in your son, but what he did on that cross. And the moment you do, you justify us. We can be justified freely by your grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. As always, we pray for someone here listening, if they have not done that, that they would believe that wonderful news this very moment, receive the forgiveness of all their sins, past, present, and future, impute his righteousness to them, and they, therefore be justified and possess the gift of eternal life. And lastly, Father, we thank you for this time of grace giving that we give in response to your word working in us and the grace you bestowed upon us to labor with you in your business to maintain and sustain uh, what goes on here at Twin Cities Grace Fellowship. We give you all the thanks and praise in Christ's name. Amen.